God is here and He is good and He is alive. Amen. Amen. If this is uh, your first week here, you're dropping in on the third week of a series we're calling Create, Creating Margin for Generosity. Creating Margin for Generosity. And the whole, the whole theme that's running through this entire series is a phrase that just says that generosity is found in the margin. Generosity is found in the margin. What I mean by that is, is that, that margin, margin is this, this space between our current needs and our limitations. Our current needs and our limitations. That in our lives, we have current needs with our time, with our talents, and with our treasure. And what I mean by that is we all have needs. We all have so much time in the day, and none of us can control that no matter how much we want to. Uh, at the end of the day, the day's over, and we don't get things in we want to get in, and that's the way the life works. But we have, we have these needs, there's things that we need to get done, but then there's also these limitations, and that's the end of the day. And our, and our treasure, our money, we only make so much money, we only have so much money, we, and we have needs. We need to eat, we need to have clothes, we need to have a food, food over our head, and fill in the blank. Our food over our head. Food in our mouths. Food over our head. That's a different Bible story altogether. Oh my. Anyway, so we have limitations also with, uh, with, with, uh, with our treasure, but we also have limitations with our talents and our abilities. We go to work and we, we use them, and, and we can wear ourselves out, and we can go too hard and too strong on those things as well, and, and not have anything to give anyone else. Uh, I would fall in there our relationships and, and how much. How much we have to build up to actually just be kind to one another, to love one another. A lot of us are so maxed out that we are empty in all of these categories. A few weeks ago, I remember uh, the Lord leading me to preach a sermon about being empty. And I had a lot of people respond to that, that that's where they feel that they're at. And, and I think it's because we've maxed out all of our margin. We don't have any margin. We don't have any space between in our lives. We're maxed out. And in our time, in our talents, and our treasures, we've pre-spent it all. It's all spoken for. But if we're supposed to be who God's asked us to be, His people, Christians, who are loving others, loving their neighbor, loving God with all our heart, living out this call to be part of His kingdom, if we're not generous, and we're not loving people and gathering them into the kingdom, showing them by the way we live our lives, that there's something other than this world that, we, that we're called to live in. If we're not doing that, then no one's going to know who Jesus is. No one's going to see Jesus through us. The church is not going to be effective. But in order to do that, we have to have margin in our lives, margin in all of these areas, so that God can work. And when everything's pre-spent, God could say to you, could say to me, Dan, I need you to move in this area. Dan, I need you to pour out your, uh, your relationships to somebody. I need you to invest in this person. Dan, there's a tragedy over here in the world, and I need, I need you to put financial, financial means towards it. But if I have a pre-spent in all of those areas, if I have no margin, then there's nothing I'm going to be able to do. And I believe that generosity is found in the margin. And so we need to create margin in our lives. Now, last week I started talking about this, this uh, topic of money, this topic of our finances, and that's always a really popular topic for a pastor to preach about this. You know, everybody loves it, and everybody, I hear more than every other sermon, people are like, oh, thank you so much for talking about money, pastor. And, uh, and I said, one of the reasons why we've pre-spent all of our money, one of the reasons why we have a tendency to do this in our society is because our society breeds in us this assumption this assumption that it's all for my consumption. That everything that I get, everything that I gather, all the money I receive is for me. For me to do what I want to do, and to go on the vacations I need, and, and to do all of those things that, is all, that we've already pre-spent all our money doing. And yet if God said to us, I need you to be generous, I need you to give back a portion of that, if it's pre-spent, if we have no margin, we're unable to do so with our finances. And so, as we talk about that, and we talk about this assumption that it's all our consumption, we also looked at this passage from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, this, apop, this uh, protege of apostle, the Apostle Paul, he was leading a church in Ephesus, one of the largest churches in, the, in this uh, area of Asia during this time, and, 
And Paul wanted Timothy to preach to the people that he was leading in this church. He wanted this young pastor to tell them many different things because they were being led astray by false teachers. And one of the false teachers was telling these people in Ephesus that becoming a Christian means that you're going to get rich. That's what he was saying. If you become a Christian, you're going to get rich. And that, and that being a Christian is a means to actual financial growth. And so Paul said to Timothy, no, 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 no. God's economy works differently than that. In fact, Paul wrote to Timothy, and this is what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, to command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. And we can get caught up on this, this word rich because when we think rich, all of us think we could be richer, right? I mean, we all do. We all, we all think, oh, if I had this much more money, life would be so much easier. But in this time period, when Paul is writing this letter, we said that these people really, to be rich meant to not have to worry about your next meal. So Paul's writing to them not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but instead to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. One of the reasons why this is important is because as we gain wealth, the richer we get, the more and more financially stable we get, something spiritually begins to happen in us, and our hope begins to migrate. Our hope begins to move, not on God, but on our wealth. And the more money we have in the bank, the better we feel about life. And, and that starts to grab a hold of us, and before you know it, we start to put all our hope in that wealth. And so, as our hope begins to migrate, Paul was writing to Timothy, and I commend to you today the rest of it. He says, command them to be good instead. To be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share. In this way, they will lay up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Because as Christians, we're not living just for this age. We're living for an age to come. For something else, another kingdom. And so we're laying up treasure in heaven, as Jesus said. But it's also so that we may take a hold of life that is truly life. So how do we be generous? How do we get there? How do we create margin in our finances? Today I want to talk about this one concept. Pre-decide. We have to pre-decide to create margin in this area. Now this should be something very common to us. We are pre-planners, pre-decision makers. Anybody else ever been a pre-planner? I mean, let me give you some simple examples of when we do that. Um, first time Jessica was pregnant. Boy, was I a pre-planner. <laughs> I pre-decided exactly when she said, Honey, it's time to go. Which way we were going to go. In fact, I think I mapped out two or three options. Um, this, was in a, this was in a different age. I could actually look and see what the traffic patterns are. Okay, well, if she decides that, that her water's going to break, if God decides it's going to be during rush hour, then I'm going to go this way. And if it's not going to be during rush hour, I'll go this way. This is the closest thing. I actually really thought about this ahead of time. I did. I really, job interview. A job interview. No one here has ever gone to a job interview without creating margin in the morning. You just don't do it. You don't show up, you know, it may be three months later, you may come flying into the parking lot, skidding on your real sideways to get into work on time. But boy, for that interview, you're going to be 20 minutes early. And you're going to make a plan beforehand. You're going to pre-decide to make sure there's margin in your morning. It's just a natural thing to do. A first date. Man, I'll tell you what. First dates don't go well for those of you that are dating if you just make it up as you go along. It's going to be a mess. That's for free this morning. Um, college, college funding. We pre-plan, we pre-decide that. House hunting, buying a new car. All of these major decisions in our life are made by pre-deciding. But if God wants us to be generous, if God wants us to create margin in our life, the only way that's going to happen is if we pre-decide to do so. If we pre-plan to do so. It's not going to happen by accident. If we don't pre-decide to have margin in our finances, if we don't decide to live lives that are generous to look toward others and toward God, it's not going to happen. Let's just be honest with ourselves. It's not going to happen. Not only that, but if we don't pre-decide to do this, without us even knowing it, our hope's going to migrate. Our hope's going to migrate. But what happens in our finances is going to control how we feel about our lives and about our days, how we worry. Now, one protection against this migration of hope this assumption that it's all for my consumption, and I said last week, what really that is, is greed. A protection against greed to make sure our hope is toward God, not our finances, that God gave His people, is what we just did. Tithing. Tithing. It's something that God gave His people. 
Now, here's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned. When people that tithe, people that give money, people that are generous in their finances, they fall into two categories. The first category I call the three S's. The three S's. Spontaneous. Spontaneous givers. So when you, you go to a concert and, you know, Compassion International is there, and they show you all these videos of all these kids, and your heart is moved, and you go and you sign up to sponsor a kid. It's a spontaneous decision. You didn't go there with a plan to do it. Or you walk past the guy we're dinging the bell in a few weeks, and you throw some money in. Or where I was at one point, the ushers came up, and they started to pass the plate, and you looked at your wife, and you said, oh my gosh, do you have any money in your wallet? I don't know to you. And you pull it out, and you try to see who has got more, and then you throw it in, or less, whichever one they are. But it's a spontaneous giving. That's what happens. It's sporadic. It's sporadic. If you're a sporadic giver, it's not something you plan for. It's just when the time presents itself or when you have money in your wallet. And if you're in my generation, you don't have money in your wallet because we don't carry cash. So the number of times that people in the front of the grocery store say to me, hey, do you want to sponsor this? I'll say, no, I don't carry cash. Okay, so it's sporadic. It's sporadic giving, and it's sparing. It's sparing. Usually it's sparing because of the first two. It's sporadic and it's, and it's spontaneous, so it's sparing. It's not, it doesn't happen all the time. But then there's this other category of givers. The 3P givers. The 3P generous people. The people that make being generous a priority in their lives. That the blessings that God has given them, they want to give to toward others. They make it a priority. It's percentage giving. It's people that have given... The, the thought and the prayer to God, how much of my financial life do you want me to live off of? And how much do you want me to give away? And they've reordered their life upon what God has asked them to do, not what they've told God they're going to do. There's a percentage in it. And it's progressive. What I mean by that is this. Is this. If you're sitting here and you're feeling judged, don't. Don't. This is not what this message is for. But the reality is to be a 3P giver, you're not going to get to the place where God called you to be generous overnight. Just like you're not going to lose 50 pounds overnight. <laughs> it's progressive. Little steps of faith at a time. Believing that the God who richly blesses will bless you as you move by faith in this area of your life. So how do you become a 3P giver? John Wesley said that the easiest way to do this is to think of it this way. Gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. That sounds easy enough. Not really. I make it even easier for me because I'm a simple guy who often is confused about these sort of things. Um, I boil it down to three words. Give, save, live. <coughs> give, save, live. So, This is how I think of my life, in three buckets. <laughs> a give bucket, a save bucket, and a live bucket. Okay? This is just how, like I said, I'm a simple guy. And so for me, and for my wife, we got to a place where we really started to believe that God wanted us to be generous. That God wanted us to tithe. That God wanted us to be 3P givers. He wanted us to make it a priority. He wanted it to be a percentage. And he wanted it to be progressive. And so we said, okay, we live off a certain percentage of our income. And if you were here last week, I told you, there was a time where we were living off over 100% of our income. And if you want to figure that out, try it. It's pretty tough. Uh, but we said, okay, in order for us to have these other two buckets, even in our financial picture, in order for us to have any savings at all, and in order for us to have any ability to be generous at all, we've got to do something with this bucket. We've got to change the percentage of our income we live off of. And we've got to give it to these other categories. And so we put a percentage and we decided. We decided with prayer and with talking to God, God, how much of our income percentage do you want me to live off of? Because how do you want me to be generous? But not only generous, but to save. Because here's the reason why saving has to be part of this. It has nothing to do with, it, it, it has to do with 
if you do not have anything in Satan, that when your car breaks down, or when the refrigerator burns out, or the hot water heater needs replaced, one thing I've found, and this is my own life, I have never robbed from the give bucket, or I've never robbed from the live bucket. I always rob from the give bucket. Let me say that in a simpler way. When something happens, if I don't have savings, I never cut the cable off. I skip the offer. It's just the way it works. I don't rob from the give, or the live bucket. I rob from the give bucket. So savings is important. We have to have something saved in our lives so that we can continue to be generous. It's just the way it works. So live, save, give. What's the percentage? Now you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, pastor, make this easy for me. Make this easy for me. Just say it out. What's the percentage I need to have in the give bucket? What's the percentage I need to have in the save bucket? What's the percentage I need to have in the live bucket? That's between you and God. That's between you and God. That's what I'm going to ask you to do today. God started very small with Jessica and I because we didn't have anything because that bucket, that live bucket was overflowing. Jesus saw this at one point as something that his disciples struggled with. And so at a point in the gospel of the Gospel of Mark, he calls them in. He's sitting actually in a temple. And if you could imagine a room like this, but it's all concrete, that people are coming in to do what God's asked them to do, to give money, to give part of their finances towards God out of obedience. And so Jesus calls them in in Mark chapter 12, and uh, he asks them to look on what he's looking at. So he sat down opposite of the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people came in and threw large amounts. So you can imagine, and this is something, if you grew up in one of those, um, one of those traditions that put how much people give in the bulletin, which we'll never do, you can promise me that, I promise you that, this is something, just imagine, it's a big temple filled with concrete, and all the rich people would come in and they would like have a coin bag, you know, and they'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. imagine me pour, pouring like a bag of coins into one of these buckets, it'd be so loud, so everybody would know how much they gave, and how proud they were, and so they're all watching this happen, and then Jesus sees this poor widow come in, and I can imagine he's with his 12 guys, and he says, hey, watch this one, and she walks in, and she threw very, two very small copper coins with only a few cents. Calling to his disciples, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all that she had to live on. It's an interesting thing. When you think about what the, what the amount needs to be, I think what Jesus is showing his disciples and wants to tell us this morning, it's not about the amount, it's about the percentage. Because here's the thing we've, we found out, especially people that have done these studies and are smarter than me. The Chronicle of Philanthropy, that's an interesting periodical, isn't it? Um, the Chronicle of Philanthropy actually looked into this, and what they found is that the migration of hope is true. And that the more people make, the less they give. So listen to this. This is really this was really interesting to me, to me this week. Americans whose household makes less than two hundred thousand. Stick with me, okay? Americans whose household make uh, I'm sorry more than two hundred thousand. So that top one percent, they give less than five percent of their wealth to charity. They give less than five percent. So then, the middle income Americans, those who those who make less than 100000 so those who household income is less than 100000 those middle income Americans, they give about 5 or 6 percent to charity. 5 or 6 percent. And then they found that the poorest Americans, those whose household is less than $50,000 a year, give 17 percent of their wealth to charity. It's not about the amount, it's about the percentage. And so sure, somebody making five hundred thousand dollars a year, they could give they could give three percent, and it's gonna be an awful lot more money than somebody who's making twenty-five thousand dollars a year. But it's about the percentage, how much 
Do you want to trust God? Solomon in Proverbs chapter 11 says that the world of the generous just gets larger and larger, and yet the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. In Malachi 3, chapter 10, this is where we get the idea of a tithe. In storehouse tithing, which it means that you bring it into the church as the place, the primary place, where you give your generous generosity. Uh, Malachi writes this from the Lord. Bring your whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. This is the only place in Scripture where God says to test Him. Now those of us with the Western mind, we think, oh, blessing, that means if I give more, I'm going to be rich. And some teachers have tried to say that through the years, and I don't think that's correct. I think the blessing you're going to get is what God does in here. Because remember, the number one, what did I say last week? The number one competition for your heart in this world is not the devil. It's your finances. And God says, test me in this. Bring your tithe to my storehouse, and I'm going to pour out heaven on you. At the end of our scripture in 1 Timothy, God can, or Paul told Timothy, tell them that through being generous, they will take a hold of life that is truly life. There is something that happens in you that when, when you start to be generous towards God and towards others, that allows you to feel a joy and a satisfaction that does not come by being stingy. How many people, I, I can tell you, Christmas morning, I'm okay with presents, I like presents, don't get me wrong, but I far more enjoy watching my little girls open their gifts. I am blessed by that. And when I have the opportunity to be generous towards somebody, it just feels good. And that's because God is calling us to be generous, but to create margin to doing so. In giving, you receive so much. And one other thing I found out, and I know that there's people in this congregation who have experienced this, you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. It's all about predeciding. It's all about putting Him first. It's all about these three words as far as I'm concerned. Give, save, live. Now, when I, when, I, uh, when I get as later with my kids, especially Lydia, Lydia's getting to that age, she's six, almost seven, one of the things I'm going to do with her when she starts getting her um, allowance is we're going to put three jars in her, in her bedroom on the dresser. One of them's going to be the gift jar. Sorry, it's over here. One of them's going to be the gift jar. One of them's going to be the save jar. And one of them's going to be the live jar. And what we're going to do is, you know, if it's a dollar, we're going to give her ten dimes. And we're going to have each week her put a dime in the gift jar. And each week we're going to have her put a dime in the save jar. And then we're going to have her put eight in the live jar. And she's going to be able to use that live for, you know, buying whatever silly toy that she'll play for a day and throw away later. You know? <laughs> but she's going to have these other two patterns in her life. Okay? Now the reason we're going to do this in my household is one of these three reasons. The first reason is this. I am so greedy that even when I'm giving her money, I'm going to want some back. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to do is when she actually gives that money to the church, I'm going to go down where the counters are and I'm going to take that dime back. Mm -hmm. Because I'm preaching this message so that she will, so I can get rich. Of course you would never think that, but sometimes pastors are accused of that. But all the church is all about money. Or, the second thing could be this. That we're so broke as a church that we need the 10 cents. That we need the 10 cents and that we're not going to be able to have the electric on next week if I don't get my daughter to give us 10 cents. Of course, you would never believe that. But sometimes people think that when there's a message like this. Or maybe, just maybe, that I love my little girl so much that I would never want her hope to migrate toward wealth. 
Maybe I know that Satan's number one desire for her is that she would want and be so greedy and want to assume that everything she has from her talents and abilities is for her so that she can't be towards, generous towards others. And maybe as her father, who loves her more than anything, I don't want her to live with the assumptions of her consumption. And maybe I love her so much that I want her to see that God will throw open his floodgates when she lives a life of generosity. That's why I'm going to do that with her. And guess what, folks? That's why I'm standing up here talking about this right now. <coughs> because if I'm going to take discipleship seriously, if I'm going to take my role as your pastor to talk to you about where God wants to move you, and where His Spirit wants to work in your life, I've got to talk about money too. Because there's no greater competition in your heart than gift, save, 